You're listening to Nightlight. Hello and a warm welcome once again to the Nightlight podcast. Very happy to have back with us on the show, David Kiran. Thanks for being with us, David. Well, thank you so much, Chris, and thanks for the opportunity. It is so good to be back here again. We have a guest tonight on Nightlight. David, I'm always so blessed by each one of your classes, so I'm very eager to know what you've chosen to share with us on the show today. I have to honestly say that they've been a real blessing for me as well because they have been a chance for me to do the things that I love most, first of all, which is to be able to dive deeper into the word and to get a lot of new truths out of it. And secondly, to just be able to share the stuff that I learn with whoever wants to listen, because I am very passionate about consistently finding out what truth God has for us today. Because one big realization that I came to some years ago is that if God is God, he's God of all. And if truth is truth, truth is applicable to every single area of our life. That's right. And so for me, just going back into the Bible and really setting it down to the depth and then taking from that and seeing how it applies to our lives today, how we can look at the truth that was given even hundreds and thousands of years ago and to look at how it applies to everyday life now for me is an extreme passion and I'm really happy about that. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to do that on this show. You're so welcome. It's nightlight. What a delight. David, what's your topic for today? Today I actually wanted to reflect on one of those truths that is timeless and it is from the lips of Jesus himself. It's contained in the Sermon on the Mount which I spent about 5 months with my group just studying and going through it word by word phrase by phrase passage by passage this particular passage is something that I've always kind of struggled with because it's not something that comes naturally to me however in the time that we've been facing for the past couple of years with the extreme uncertainty and with the extreme fear that has been prevalent across the world since the pandemic began in early 2020 i think some of these scriptures have taken on a new light for me and so the passage i want to study today is what jesus had to say to his disciples when he told them to take no thought or in other words do not worry so chris if you have your bible handy please can you read to us from the 6th chapter of Matthew beginning with verse 25 through 34 my pleasure one of my favorite passages too no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other you cannot serve god and mammon therefore i say to you do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not of more value than they which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature so why do you worry about clothing consider the lilies of the field how they grow they neither toil nor spin and yet i say to you that even solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these now if god so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven will he not much more clothe you o you of little faith therefore do not worry saying what should we eat or what should we drink or what should we wear for after all these things the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things but seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things sufficient for the day is its own trouble perfect thank you chris very beautiful passage very profound passage honestly one of the passages that i had the most trouble with really because somehow the saying of jesus didn't really sit right with me I mean it seems almost careless to not worry about the future 
or to not be thinking about what comes ahead. For the longest of times, I just kind of put this passage in the background because I couldn't really face the truth of it or I didn't really see how it applied to me. I guess, like I said, with the pandemic and with everything and just the whole cycle of fear and worry, because there was a lot of periods of uncertainty. And I think also if you think to your life or your listeners also think back in your life, for the past two years, especially at the beginning, there were re very real fears. Yes. Like what's going to happen tomorrow? Are we going to get sick? Are we going to end up in a bad place? Is someone I love going to die? And those were very real fears. After a couple of months, once we were fully in the throes of it, the worry started becoming, are we ever going to get back to normal? Is life ever going to go back the way it was before? Are we going to be able to meet the people that we love again? And then as that continued on for a few more months, the worry started becoming, what are we going to do when we are unable to experience life the way that we're used to? It's true. And then after a few more months, the worry then became, well, now that these two years have gone by, now the economy is in trouble. Now a lot of people have lost their jobs. Now there is the threat of war and there's a threat of, of inflation and there's a threat of economic crash. And there's just so many things around that can cause us to worry. That's right. So I went back to this passage trying to understand it to see what Jesus was really getting to. Because actually when you study the rest of Jesus' teachings, I realized that I actually had a pretty incorrect view of it at first glance, because Jesus is not advocating a lack of planning. Right. Jesus in other places specifically said that there has to be times where you stop and where you think and where you consider and where you make your plans and where you seriously have to take stock of everything before deciding what to do next. So Jesus over here is not bashing planning. He's not saying that we should just live from day to day, fly by the seat of our pants and not really worry what's coming up. But what Jesus is saying here is that though you are planning for the future, and though you are looking into the future and preparing for the future, and though you are taking stock of the things now while anticipating what may come ahead, you should not be worrying about that future because that is what we're not supposed to do. Yes. And because that command comes from Jesus, then it serves that it is something we should then take to heart. Absolutely. But it was something I couldn't really come to grips with because for me, I kind of felt almost a duty to worry. And maybe some of you can relate to this. Sometimes we do feel almost that duty to worry. Like if I don't worry about finances, I'm not being responsible. If I am not worrying about my children, then I'm not being responsible. If I'm not worrying about my health, then I'm not being responsible. If I'm not worrying about what's going to happen in the economy, then I'm not being responsible. If I'm not worrying about where we're going to live in a few months, then I'm not being responsible. And it seems that we have conflated the idea of worrying with the idea of responsibility. But that's actually a very incorrect equation because when we're responsible for something, we need to do something about it. But worrying also comes in as a substitute to doing. Good point. And not only that, worry is usually for something that lies in the future of which we can do nothing for until it comes. And there are some things that we could possibly do in the present, but worrying about it in the future actually detracts from us doing anything about this now. And so I began to do some studies about it. Like, well, why was Jesus so against worry? Why was Jesus so adamant that he did not want us to be worrying about tomorrow? And what does worry do to us? Right. So I started doing some research and I came across this incredible book. It's by a man called Robert Sapolsky. And he wrote this book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Zebras. And it is to me. I think one of the best books that I've read over the past couple of years, because it helps us to understand 
exactly what worry and stress does to us as human beings. So he, in his book, he talks about how all creatures in the natural world experience events that are dangerous, experience events that are stressful. He calls these acute stressors. And this is danger that happens in our natural world or things that confront us, that make us feel that we are in danger. Right. So we'll use the example of a zebra because this is the example that he uses. So take a zebra. When a zebra goes through the jungle, going, wandering around on its merry way, occasionally it encounters a lion. And when it encounters the lion, it's in trouble. It now has two options, run for your life or be eaten. And so the body responds to that dangerous circumstance. What the body does, it begins to produce the response needed within the zebra to be able to escape. And so there's a part of our brain known as the limbic system. And the limbic system, once it registers danger, it signals to our hypothalamus that it is time to start producing the stress hormones because the stress hormones are the things that are going to save the zebra's life. Those stress hormones are cortisol and adrenaline. And when faced with a dangerous situation, the zebra's body produces cortisol and adrenaline. Okay. What these two hormones do it, first of all, it produces a rapid mobilization of energy from stored sites in the body. It increases the heart rate and expands the breathing and pumps up the blood pressure. So that way the zebra can run far and fast. It also rapidly empties out any excess waste in the zebra's body because it doesn't want the zebra to carry any extra weight. It is also, it heightens the zebra's senses, its sense of smell increases, its eyesight increases, its reactions increases. And then so in that moment, the zebra is able to run as fast as it can in order to preserve its life. Very interesting. Human beings have this exact same response. When there is something that we consider to be dangerous, when there's something that we consider to be life-threatening. When there's something that we consider to be scary, our body also produces cortisol and adrenaline. And this causes a rapid mobilization of energy, which is why our body starts heating up. Have you ever noticed when you're afraid, you start feeling flushed? Or when you're startled, your skin starts feeling warm. That's because of the rapid mobilization of energy. Your heart rate increases, your breathing increases, your blood pressure goes up. Right. That is when you start to sweat. That is when you start feeling tingly. That is when you start getting shallow, faster breaths. It's true. Your body also tries to eliminate any excess weight that it has, which is why most people, when they're scared, they feel like urinating. And also... Your senses are heightened. Your hearing gets better. Your seeing gets better. You get far more jumpy because your body is ready to escape. Those hormones are God's way of making sure that you're able to escape from danger in your life. Interesting. Those hormones are God's way of making sure that zebra is able to escape from danger and live. Because if the zebra died every single time the lion chased it, then they would be an extinct species by now. Right. The balance of nature would be upset. And so God naturally put those impulses into them. The problem is, is that those two big, powerful hormones also cause a lot of upset within the body because the body operates on what's known as a homeostatic balance. And the homeostatic balance would basically keeps you on an even keel. Okay. When any hormone is introduced, it changes the balance of your body. And so your body then has to compensate afterwards in order to bring it back to normal. So these stress hormones, they interfere with everything else that your body does. It interferes with your digestion. You lose all appetite when you're afraid. 
And in fact, when you're running on adrenaline, you can go for hours, sometimes days without even feeling hunger. It also messes with your sleep because why do you need to sleep when your life's in danger? You need to stay awake, which is why the cortisol is actually a melatonin inhibitor. When people have a lot of stress in their lives, they often have difficulty sleeping because of this reason. The stress hormones also suppress your reproductive cycle. The stress hormones also suppress growth and the repair of tissues and cells within your body. Very interesting. The stress hormones also suppress your immunity. You're more likely to fall sick and get ill when you are in a moment of stress. In fact, sustained stress over a period of time is one of the chief causes of diseases today. What it also does is the stress hormones also minimize your pain receptors. The craziest thing of all is that your stress hormones, this cortisol and adrenaline, they change and affect your cognitive and sensory skills. You're not able to think straight and reason properly because your only thought at this moment of time is go, go, go. And so the zebra encounters a lion. The zebra's body fills up with these hormones, the zebra runs for its life. And then one of two things happen. Either the zebra gets caught and his life is over, or the zebra escapes and then goes back to feeding. And when it escapes and goes back to feeding, the body then is able to release that stress. The body's then able to release those hormones. And then the body goes back into homeostatic balance and the zebra carries on as normal. It's able to eat again. It's able to sleep again. It's able to repair itself again. It's able to boost its immunity again. It's able to think clearly again. Nightlight Insights. Human beings suffer the same responses, but human beings are the only creatures on planet Earth who can sustain the stress response by merely thinking of a stressful event. Gosh, it's true. This has been tested widely by scientists. They have discovered that human beings are the only creatures on planet Earth who, sitting in their bed, surrounded by absolute comfort, in the lap of luxury, with just the perfect temperature, having eaten a full meal and having a full and comfortable amount of money in their bank account can actually experience almost physical pain because they are thinking about something stressful or something dangerous that might be coming on the horizon. And in short, what does this boil down to? Worry will actually kill you. It's true. An abundance of stress within your body, they're realizing is a cause for heart disease, for liver disease, for kidney failure, for cancer, for so many of the diseases that we know today, they are caused not so much by what's going on around us, but a large majority of it is being caused by or is being aided by what's going on inside us. Yes. The overwhelming stress that we put ourselves under when we worry about something that hasn't happened yet. When we worry about something that could possibly go wrong. When we worry about something that isn't even in our control, but it disturbs us. But we're worried what's going to happen if we're unable to face it. We are going through the constant what if scenarios. Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? And what that does, that puts us in a place where we are not only compromising our thoughts and basically our peace of mind and our emotional state and our mental state, but we're also seriously compromising our physical state as well. So true. It was an Israeli researcher. His name was Daniel Kahneman. And he wrote a great book, which he won a Nobel Prize for, by the way, called Thinking Fast and Slow, 
about how our brain generally processes information. His work was into the study of cognitive biases. One of the most important things that he says that a human being needs is the ability to confirm or disconfirm something. That's right. When something comes up, the only way a human being will actually get a measure of peace is if he is able to go and check if it is right or if it is not. For example, if you're in the dark, you're at home, and you hear a creak, you automatically start panicking. It's like, oh, wow, where do I go from here? Who, who could that be? It could be anything. Your mind goes wild. Could it be a robber? Could it be a ghost? Could it be anything? And then you start feeling all those surges of danger. But then you get up and you walk over to it and you realize one of your kids is just getting up to go to the bathroom. Right. Instantly, you feel all right. You feel relieved. It's nothing to worry about. We're fine. Go back to bed. Or let's say it is the worst case scenario. There is a robber there. But now you have realized the danger. And now all those stress hormones actually come into handy. They get you thinking quickly about that particular event. Who do I call? Where's the phone? Where's the alarm system? How do I take care and handle this situation? And so one of the greatest things that every single human being needs in a situation where one perceives danger is the ability to confirm or disconfirm. But when we worry about something, when we're afraid of something, when we think about what could possibly go wrong in the future, we have zero ability to confirm or disconfirm because it hasn't happened yet. Right. We don't know. It is completely unknown. And so because it is completely unknown, we will never be certain about whether good will happen or whether bad will happen or whether the things we're afraid of will happen or not. And so we sit and so we suffer. Even though today our lives may be going wonderfully and God may be looking out for us and taking care of us, and we may be experiencing his hand of providence and his abundant blessings, we can be emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually in anguish because we are worrying about what is not yet come. So sad. Because we're worrying about what we do not control. We worry about what is outside the bounds of our knowledge or understanding. And that's the very thing that Jesus says, I don't want you to do. And when I realized that, that just blew my mind. Like, Lord, how wise, how great, how incredible. You do want me to make my plans. Yes. You do want me to think about my family. Yes. You do want me to think about my needs. You do want me to think about what I'm going to do. You do want me to think about the future. You do want me to take time to count the cost and to prepare and to plan. Right. You do want me to be a good steward and to be a faithful servant to you. But what you don't want me to do is to worry. You don't want me to be fearful. Okay, once again, Matthew 6, verses 27 through 31. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Perfect. Thank you. So this was, this was my big realization. Jesus had an incredibly God-saturated view of the world. Of course he was. He was God. 
He's telling his disciples here. He's like, look, look at the lilies of the field. Where do they get their nourishment from? Where do they get their life force from? They get it from God. Look at the birds of the air. Where do they get their nourishment from? Where do they get their life from? They get it from God. Now, there was, there's a very interesting and important reason why he points out the birds and the flowers. Because the flowers grew in the ground and the birds flew in the air. There's a reason for this. Chris, can you read me Genesis chapter 2, verse 7? It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The ground and the air. Jesus is telling his disciples, You too were formed from the dust of the ground, and you too were given the breath of God in your lungs. God gave you life. Do you not think he's going to sustain your life as well? God created you. Don't you think he's going to look after you? God is the one who formed you, who knew you from the beginning of time. Do you think that he is going to forget about you in this moment and in the moments to come? Do you really think that the God of heaven who created you has not seen to it that he is going to look after you? Inspiring you to draw closer to God, you're listening to Nightlight. Could you read Psalms 139, verse 13 through 16, Chris? It says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So the psalmist basically says, and says, look, you were the one who formed me. You were the one who put me together. You were the one who gave me life, and you are the one who continually sustains my life. And as Jesus says over here to his disciples, just like the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, who God looks after, you too are a creation of God, who God is looking after as well. Yes. What this comes down to then is when we are worrying, we are a little bit too big in our own eyes. And for me, this was my realization. And for me, this was what kind of got me started on this path of surrendering my worries to the Lord more. When we worry, it is because we are a little bit too big in our own eyes. I want to ask you to just think about what are some of the things that you worry about right now? And then ask yourself, is that something that's really under your control? Is it really something that is under your control and that you have complete autonomy and authority to do something in? 99.9% .9 of the time, the things that we worry about are things that are outside the bounds of our control. Either they have to do with a circumstance that's around us, they have to do with something that another person is doing, which we have no control over, has to do something that's there within the climate and situation of the world over which we have no control. 99.9% .9 of our worries come from things that are outside what we can control, come from things in the future of which we have zero ability to control. Dr. Henry Cloud, who is a famous Christian psychologist who has worked with 
people like Rick Warren and others around the world. He had this to say in one of his really good books, which is called How People Grow. He said this, according to the Bible and according to what's written out in the book of James, there are only three things that any of us can control. Our thoughts, our words, our actions. Everything outside of that is out of our control. But the problem with most of us is that we try so hard to control the things that are not ours to control. It's true. That we end up losing control over the things that we can actually use to make a difference in a situation. Our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And so when we are worried about something, and it's something that we can't control, but we're still worrying about it, perhaps we are a little bit too big in our own eyes. Perhaps we think a little too much of ourselves and a little bit too little of God. As Dr. Henry Cloud says, he says, the first place to regaining your peace of mind is to give back to God the things that he can control and put our focus solely on what we can control and what is happening within our present. And that's exactly what Jesus tells us to do as he closes off this passage. Chris, back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 to 34. Sorry, 32 to 34. Verse 32 to 34. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So what does Jesus tell us to do? Your heavenly Father is looking after these things. What should you do? Look to him. Look to God. Look to his kingdom. Seek that above all. And then he will take care of you because he's your father in heaven. And because those are the things that he has under his control. And therefore, do not take that worry for tomorrow because today itself has enough trouble in it. All you have is what's in front of you. All you can deal with is what's in front of you. All that you have been given is what you have to face right now. That is what you can impact and influence through your words, through your thoughts, and through your actions. Anything beyond that belongs in God's control and should be entrusted to him. Anything in the future should be left to him. As the great, I think it was Dwight L. Moody, who said when someone came up to him and said, uh, Dr. Moody, do you have dying grace? And he said, to be honest, I don't know, because I'm not dying yet. Very true. That's right. It's impossible to have grace for something that's coming in the future that we are not facing yet. The Lord promises us in the Bible that as our days, so will our strength be. Amen. The future belongs to the Lord. He is already there. He has already determined the outcome. Praise God. And he has promised to work everything out according to his will and purpose. Amen. Should we think for the future? Yes. Should we plan for the future? Absolutely. Should we do our best to be faithful? Oh, yes. You owe that as unto the Lord. But in doing all of that, do not worry for the future. Do not be so large in your own sight that you think that whether or not you worry about something is going to affect the outcome. Rather, seek first the Lord. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. Put your trust in God because you are his creature, just like the birds and just like the lilies. You are his child and he's got you and he is taking care of you 
and he will bring you to the place that he has for you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and I hope to be back again soon. You're welcome back anytime, David, and thanks so much for that very timely class that will help us all to have faith and trust and peace of mind and not to worry. I'll be back soon with another Nightlight Show. God bless you all. Bye-bye.